Oh joy, I can't wait for everybody to take this one scene from the episode, get in a hissy fit, upset, and just want this entire series shut down and never written again, or never have another anime episode ever again, whatever the case may be. Just, I cannot wait just to see how many people get upset. And so, to tackle the elephant in the room, let's get right into that. Let's get right into Naofumi owning... A slave, or a Roth uh, Talia. I, I think that's how you say it, Roth Talia. If I'm saying it wrong, correct me in the comments below. But basically, now Fumi, he gets a party member in this episode. And it's not a party member you would normally expect in a fantasy show, a Sekai, whatever. Now, the concept of slaves in a series, like media, anime, whatever, it is something that you see all the time. I mean, you can think of many anime and manga probably on the top of your head that has that theme in it to where the MC fights back against it, says it's wrong, this is, should not be a thing in society, let's get rid of this, which it is true. You know, slavery is wrong, it shouldn't be in society at all. But the point is though, it's a common media trope you see, and in this case, normally the MC is always against it, always wanting to completely get rid of it instantly, goes up against the main slave trader and tries to get rid of them like that, like instantly but that was not the case with this episode. It's actually very different, a different direction than you would normally see from a written piece of work. Now, let's get into that. Okay, so now Fumi, why? Why did he get Raftalia? Why, why, why did he decide to, you know, pick her, make her his slave, and use her to be able to get powerful? Why did he do that? Well, we gotta look back at the events of the first episode and what happened to him. Remember, the reason why he has to be so malicious is because of what the king, uh, mine, and all of them did to him. And so obviously, he has, he's having to do anything he possibly can to be able to survive in this world. That's not even talking about the waves upcoming that he's gonna have to survive as well. So, I mean, his entire personality shift right now, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, if you literally got hammered down in the dirt and you literally, you know, had nothing else to do or nobody else to turn to, he probably would act like Naofumi as well. And so that is the reason why he had to go even to that place of all places just to be able to get someone to help him level up. Because if it wasn't for that, he would not even probably be able to get strong. He wouldn't even be able to get past level one. That's how ridiculous it would be. So that is the point here is that it's thanks to the country itself that really forced him to go this path. Now I know many are saying yes, but even then the country forced this. He had options. He had other choices. Yeah, maybe. He might have been able to find a weirdo that would help him out, but that probably is not, you know, gonna happen. I mean, this series at the very least has taken a very realistic approach to how, you know, news spreads, to how people view the type of person that, you know, Naofumi is being accused of, and so obviously nobody really wants to help him because of what type of heinous things he potentially could have done. So the only way he could really go and level up and get stronger is by just embracing what people think he is and trying to get someone to help him forcefully if he has to, which that's where Raftelia comes in into this episode. So anyways, let's uh, let's look at how he treated her, Raf. I I'm just going to call her Raf for now, okay? When you look at how he treated her in this episode. He did not treat her as if she was a lower being than him. I want everybody to take a quick note of that, okay? Before you start judging Nafumi as a character, you start saying he's malicious or a bad dude, take a moment to look at the way he treated her, his actions, not his words. Don't look at his words. Don't look at what he said in the episode, okay? Just completely disregard the words. Just look at his actions alone of what he did for Raph alone, and you'll see what type of man he really is. He is a good dude. I mean, think about it. He literally, when she woke up, instead of trying to slap her or tell her to, you know, be quiet, shut up or whatever, he grabbed her, held her, and allowed her to calm down. That's a very big sign that he isn't a malicious individual and he's looking down upon Raph and making her feel like she's less than even a living being. And then on top of that, he bought her a mill. If we look at when he buys a mill for her and himself, he actually gets a crappy mill compared to her. And that's the main point here. The message is, is that you cannot look at his dialogue. The way he you know, says words, certain words to her, that's not really what's going on. Underneath, he has this facade. Like, he has this facade where he's acting like a mean guy, but deep down, he's hurt emotionally and physically, and he just wants to, you know, 
actually, you know, be better or, you know, have someone that is there with him. He wants to actually be a hero that helps people, but people really don't want to accept it. He's kind of been suppressed in a way to where he cannot act like he wants to, you know, be a nice guy, but, you know, he has to be like that just to be able to get anything done. So that's the big point here is you can get from a lot of Naofumi's actions in this episode that he's a good guy. But if you were just to look at face value, look at his words, that's, you know, you would say he's a bad dude, which I think that's the entire message here of what this episode was really trying to show from the starting episode to this episode now, because let's think about it. When we look at the first episode, we got to see firsthand us as the viewer of the show. We saw that Naofumi was a good guy. He was a little bit unaware of things around, obviously. I mean, it's a new world. I mean, seriously. But, I mean, he was a very good dude. It seemed like he had his, you know, heart in the right place. He was caring about the people around him. Even though he was being mistreated in a way right at the start, he still cared. You could see he had a good heart in the first episode. And then, at the end, everybody painted this picture of him being an awful dude. And he's like what? Like, I, I, I've been so nice and good, and then you do this to me? And the reason why he's acting like he is now is because people took advantage of that kindness. They took advantage of the smile, happy, smiley, happy face he had, and now they used it against him at the end of episode one. And so in episode two, the reason why he's acting so malicious is because if he shows that good side, people most likely will use him, and he'll be back to square one all over again. So that's the big message here. What that tried to show us with the actions he had towards Raph in this episode. Now anyways, let's talk about the main message besides that, what he was doing for her, okay? Raph, it's clear as day from the little brief flashback we got with her to also her waking up in the night to the final segment to where, you know, she takes down the two-headed dog. You know, she has went through a lot as a child, more than any child should have to at her age. And you can't, you're not even probably factoring in that she was thrown into slavery. So she's just had a horrible freaking life, okay? Raph has not had a good time as a child, and obviously the MC is very aware of this. But at the same time, even though he is aware of this, he's trying to help her out in his own way. Which, once again, goes back to what I said earlier in this video, actions speak louder than words. And that is what he was doing. See, at the start of the episode, when he starts, you know, manhandling Raph, like, grabs her, carries her with him, and all that, and when he's ordering her to do certain things, like, you know, take out this, uh, you know, this monster, this little balloon monster, or take down this rabbit, it seems kind of messed up. It's like, whoa, like, you're making this little child do stuff like this, and the way he says certain words, it seems awful. But, you gotta look at it from a different perspective. The way he's doing that, he was actually trying to train her to be able to defend herself, where nobody will ever mistreat her, but also, he was allowing her to try to overcome her issue, her trauma that she had in her childhood. That is what he was doing for her. So that final segment of the episode, when he was telling her, ordering her to fight the two had a dog, you know, the reason why he did that was for she could overcome that. Overcome that issue to where, like, she can be a stronger individual, to where she could stand up to her past, move forward, and not let something like that ever happen again to other people. And that's what the MC was trying to make clear to her. He's like, look, your parents, they're, they're never coming back. Your town, whatever, they're never coming back. It's gone. You cannot change that. What is done is done. But at the same time, you can at least pick up a sword, pick up a weapon, and defend new towns, new, you know, people, other demi-humans. You can help them out and allow it to where they never have to go through what you went through. And that's kind of what he was trying to teach her. He wasn't just teaching her how to fight. He wasn't just trying to teach her to be able to level himself up. He was teaching her for she could defend herself and help others out even if he was to die that is an incredible moment for his character just to show and what really emphasized this even more is that when he tells her to fight the two-headed you know dog but she slowly starts to back up still a little bit but and then he's like you know what forget it just get out of here the reason why he said that was because he's like i'm not going to force this girl that doesn't want to fight i want her to run for i can at least die to protect her that's kind of what he was doing in that moment and that is why she you know was really shocked and decided to save him in the first place because it was a reenactment of what happened to her parents. And so when she jumped in to save him, it was her overcoming that trauma. So yeah, it's a good episode. I, I like the message behind that. I do. I know in some ways it's a little bit quick 
for her to overcome her trauma, I do think it is a little bit too quick. I think it should have been a little bit longer, at least another episode, until she overcame something like that. But I guess, in a way, it does make sense, because there's probably a lot more behind the scenes that we don't really know, because we know that the Demi-Humans, in some ways, they, you know, really care about the S.H.I.E.L.D. hero. That was mentioned in this episode. It was stated that the Demi-Humans really like the S.H.I.E.L.D. hero, because the S.H.I.E.L.D. hero treats them with respect. And that is very different from what we've seen set up with the first episode. So let's actually get into that. So with the first episode of Tate no Yusha, it was clear as day that the spear hero, the um, the bow, the sword, whatever, all those three heroes, they were renowned as being amazing. When we look at how the king has treated them and all that, it was clear that they were getting a lot of respect. While the shield hero, he was shafted because he was the lame duck, a part of the group. And seeing how the Demi-Humans were acting towards the S.H.I.E.L.D. hero, at least in the flashback, it paints a completely different picture. And what I'm assuming is happening here is that most likely because of how the S.H.I.E.L.D. heroes are always repressed and they are not allowed to really function properly like maybe how the Spear hero, the Sword hero, the Bow hero is, I'm assuming that is why, you know, the Demi-Humans were able to relate with the S.H.I.E.L.D. hero, vice versa, was because the S.H.I.E.L.D. hero was in a very similar situation as the Demi-Humans, which that is another point here. Demi-Humans aren't treated with respect in this world. It's clear that they are not, because, I mean, we even see a sign when Raph was going to get a mill when Nafumi, it said we do not serve Demi-Humans. So, Demi-Humans, they're segregated, they're not even allowed to go into pubs and get food or whatever, they have to live on the street, which explains the slavery problem, why that's even a thing in the first place. So, in a way, when you really think about it, Raph locked out getting Nafumi to grab her because if it would have been anyone else she probably would have died before her childhood was over for her so it's a, a grim outlook on things but at the same time though it paints a picture that maybe the reason why the demi humans respect the shield hero is because they understand they understand how it feels to be pushed down in society and nobody respects you whatsoever and i think that is the reason so the shield hero is kind of the demi humans hero so anything else left to talk about i guess let's talk about the other tiny little elements of, let's say, the upgrades to the level-ups and stuff like that to the music. Okay, so, music-wise, it, oh my god, like, the music is really good in this series. Like, the first episode's music was quality, but hearing the music in this episode as well, just when the scene with the two-headed dog popped up and you hear the music playing in the background and, you know, the Wrath had to go in and protect now Fumi, it was a great scene. I, I like, holy crap, the music is good. And then the scene, you know, later on with the little montage and all that when, you know, they were leveling up and stuff. I, I, I do like the music in this series, and I think that it's honestly what really makes me come back to the series. Besides just the awesome story, I just love the music. It's so good. Now, in terms of uh, little elements of leveling up to, you know, finding ways to make money, our MC is doing the old-fashioned way to make money. I, I respect that. The man is, you know, harvesting herbs. He's, uh, you know, going around collecting ore, which is what was happening towards the end, to be able to make money to be able to buy things. Because remember, he lost everything in the first episode. He has no money. Nobody's really going to support him. So he has to go out of his way to make his own money, which is pretty awesome because, I mean, now we get to see him slowly try to figure out things about this world and try to better himself and everyone else around him. It's very organic on how he's learning about things in this world because when he goes up to the vendor and all that, he's like, uh, so which one sells better? You know, the medicine or, you know, these uh, raw herbs? Which one sells more? And the dude's like, it's most likely the medicine sells more ever since the wave and all that. You know, medicine's been flying off the shelves. So I do like how the MC is gaining information as time progresses and it feels like, you know, he's actually learning while we're learning as well and it doesn't feel like everything's being given to him right at the start. He's happened to do trial and error to be able to make money, which is kind of what you do when you play a game as well. If you don't look up walkthroughs or guides or whatever, usually you have to do trial and error to be able to figure out how to make money in certain games. I remember I had to do that when I was playing World of Warcraft, so I mean, that's a big point there. So yeah, overall, I would say that this is a good episode. It's a great episode. It has a lot of development for Nalfumi as a character. It has Raph introduced and allows us to see what type of person she is. And I do really appreciate how this story is very different from the typical Asekai series, which is why I even decided to give it a shot in the first place. So yeah, I can't wait to see what's going to happen next. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you enjoy my content, you know, please subscribe. If you like this video, please leave a like. And if you want to get notified for whenever I upload a video, please click the bell icon down below. And with that, Chibi out.